Hello, this is just a quick video on this fascinating little bit of history. Uh, this is a British World War I military billock. Uh, this is made by a company called Martindale and it's more than 100 years old, it's an original. Uh, and I just wanted to give some insight into a little known tool with an amazing, if sometimes quite bloody, history. And um, they were sometimes used as trench weapons. Um, which I'm going to come on to. So firstly, what on earth is a billock? So a billock, which you'll often see called a brish hook, brush hook, brishing hook, etc. Uh, it's a cutting tool. It's used for cutting small to medium uh, green wood, mostly green wood. Um, they're an ancient design, they're thousands of years old, and they're used in Britain mostly for hedge laying, which is the craft of making and maintaining hedges, um, as well as other kind of common kind of countryside chopping tasks. So the blade is here. And you'll see it's curved, hence bill hook. Um, the reason uh, kind of varies depending on who you speak to. Um, I think it is for edge uh, protection. So these are very sharp. They're normally kept very, very sharp. Um, they're used almost exclusively outdoors. And if you're hedge laying, you're working often very close to the ground. If you swing with this and you miss and you hit the ground, you'll see that's it flat there. Um, that is going to hit the ground first. And what that should do, if there are any rocks here, is stop that edge from hitting the rock and blunting or rolling um, and basically uh, putting a severe crimp in your working day. Because now you've got to take time out, you've got to go and sharpen it and get it back up to a condition where you can just use it. So I think that's probably the main reason for the curve. But it is also very useful when you're chopping um, because you'll find it kind of gathers the foliage, it gathers and it gives it a real good cut. Um, the, it's also, a, you know, use it as a hook, you can drag foliage down from above you, grab it with your hand, you know, give it a good chop with a billock, uh, and you can use it to kind of gather and flick kind of cut material back off the ground, you know, flick it into a hedge or, you know, wherever you want to, whatever you want to do with it. So it's quite a good design having that kind of curve. And if it was a, a kind of a flat design, you wouldn't be able to do any of that. Um, so I strongly suspect that that is where the curve has come from. Um, but opinion is, is kind of divided, divided on that point. So these were an agricultural tool. In the Middle Ages, they were modified, um, mounted on a much longer shaft, uh, and they were called a bill, and that was a weapon. And soldiers used them uh, to quite great success. Um, it was a very common weapon, used a bit like a pike. Um, and when World War I kicked off, the original kind of shortened design, well, I say original design, there are actually hundreds, if not thousands, of different designs, different patterns for billocks. But the original kind of design it was issued to soldiers who went to fight in the trenches um, like this one. So this one was made by a company called Martindale. Uh, hopefully you can make this out. It says Martindale Crocodile Works. That's the little crocodile there registered. He's a registered crocodile uh, made in Birmingham, England. And Martindale is still going. It's still trading. I think they no longer make tools in England, but you can buy Martindale tools. Um, and you'll notice here it says 1918. Flip it over. This is a bit harder to work out. See that little arrow there? That shows you that it is a military issued tool. Um, so these things were shipped out to soldiers fighting in France in the First World War. Um, quick word on the design of it. It is very, very thick. It is very, very heavy. So this one weighs about two pounds. And for reference, probably most billocks are about half that, maybe one, one and a half pounds, some smaller ones, even less than that. Um, most billocks can be comfortably used all day or certainly for many hours um, without getting seriously tired. This one, if you used it all day, you would definitely know about it. Um, it's really heavy and the weight is very far forward. When you have your arm extended, you can really feel it. It puts quite a lot of strain on the forearm, but it wasn't really designed to be used for hours at a time. I'm gonna come on to that. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm just gonna compare for you this with a, a more kind of classic billock design. So this one is actually quite a large one still. This one is made by a company called Staniforth, which is another English tool maker. And it's the Sever Quick. I love all these old tool names. The Staniforth Sever Quick. Um, it's got a bit of a more pronounced hook here. Um, but as I say, you know, these things came in hundreds, thousands of different designs. 
Um, it's very light. It's it's quite thick. You know that blade. It won't bend. It's not a machete. It's much thicker. So it won't bend, but it's, it's light enough that you can use it for quite a long time. And this is quite a big example. I think this is a ten inch. Um, whereas most billets probably. 10 11 probably the biggest you're going to find but have a look at how thick that blade is there i reckon that's about three four mil thick and it's pretty consistent all the way along now just compare that to the world war one here that's probably about 10 mil thick and narrows ever so slightly but then down towards the end you see there probably just about make it out it gets a lot thicker um, it is a very serious chopping tool. Um, now, as far as I can work out, there's not a lot of information on the World War I use of billocks. But as far as I can work out, it was issued to uh, engineers, uh, machine gunners, artillery, uh, and they used it for things like clearing, firing positions, you know, gathering foliage for camouflage, that sort of thing. Um, and for wartime use, I imagine it's great. It's very, very thick. It's unbreakable. Uh, you can abuse it. You can use it, abuse it, and it's still going to work. Um, so quick word. That's the talk about the blade. Let's talk about the handle. Um, this may be the original. Uh, it might not. It's certainly very old. Um, I have seen very similarly shaped handles in other photos of World War One billets. It might be the original. And this thing is so heavy. Obviously, it's made its way back from the war to civilian life. Uh, it might well be that the thing was so heavy that someone's just shoved it in a drawer. And that's why it hasn't fallen prey to a lot of the things that normally um, wreck billock handles, which is uh, woodworm or the handle splitting, either from use or because the tang, which is the bit of metal inside here, rusts and that will crack the wood. Um, this has got neither of those problems. So... It might be the original, uh, and I've just got lucky, or it might be that someone has made another handle based on the old one. And the reason I think that might be possible is because this thing here, the ferrule, it doesn't quite match the handle. You see there's a gap there. That's quite unusual. These things, I mean, they're, you know, are they precision bits of engineering? Probably not, but they were very well made. And you will find that there is flush here, so there's been no movement there. The movement is here. So either the wood has kind of expanded somehow and, and kind of, I don't know, kind of grown this way, or it was badly built in the first place, which I think is extremely unlikely, or someone has made a new handle using maybe the original ferrule and they've tried to fit it and it's kind of gone. It hasn't quite gone. And then in classic British fashion, they thought, oh, well, that'll do. Uh, and they kind of got on with their day. Um, it may well be with this one, so the year is 1918, it may well be that it never saw much uh, real use because the armistice was in November of 1918. However, you know, similar examples do exist from earlier in the war. Um, and this wasn't just a tool, it was issued as a tool. And my understanding is that it was issued, um, you know, sort of a few of them were issued to groups of soldiers involved with machine guns, artillery and so on. If you know more about this, please do comment in the in the comment section um there are accounts of them being used as weapons on trench raids so this was when um british soldiers would raid the german trenches with the view to uh kill uh capture men or material or information um and they were used they would often fight hand to hand and they used these alongside other tools and we know this because there's an account of it we've got it, i've got it right here um so this is a book called Drawing Fire by Private Len Smith. Uh, Len Smith was a Londoner. He signed up as an infantryman, uh, later a sniper. Um, and he wrote an awful lot uh, about the war. Uh, and this is what he's got to say about fighting with bullocks. So the British, they've uh, tried to raid a German trench. Uh, Len has found himself there. And he says, I certainly don't remember how I got down, but I do know there were swarms of Huns. Huns was um, the kind of slang term for the Germans at the time. There were swarms of Huns who made themselves very troublesome. I happened to find myself at a deep dugout by a machine gun emplacement. The gun had been lowered down a well on a chain for protection, I imagine. Three Germans came bounding up the steps, 
like cornered rats, ready to bite. I stood very alert, with bayonet poised, ready for the first man, when I was suddenly, violently, pushed aside, and one of our sergeants, with the words, leave it to me, rushed at the foremost German with a billhook, which he puts in inverted commas, and then he, he describes it in brackets as a trench chopper, and cut the man's head clean in two down the centre. I don't ever wish to see such a sight again in this lifetime. And then he goes on to say that the other two Germans surrendered straight away, crouched down in panic, he says, and were ushered back to the British lines. Um, you know, it's quite a violent description of what this can do when not used for its original purpose. Um, you know, he's by the time he gets to this point in the book, he's described shelling, he's described trench raids, he's described machine guns. Uh, he is a seasoned soldier, um, and the use of of seeing one of these used on uh, used on on the enemy um, obviously had a very profound effect on him. Um, I think you know you certainly would not want to be on the wrong end of of one of these. Um, now, I am interested to what extent these were used in the First World War and how they were used. And I think Len's account, it gives us an interesting insight. So I'm, I'm quite interested that he knows what a billock is at all. So Len, uh, he was a Londoner, born and bred. There's pretty much no use for billocks in London. They're a countryside tool, really. Um, Len Smith, he was also an infantryman. He was later a sniper. He was not a machine gunner. He was not an engineer. So he and this sergeant, presumably, they wouldn't have been issued one of these. Um, or they wouldn't have had access to a kind of communal store um, per unit where, where these things were handed out. They certainly didn't have to carry them around, soldiers didn't have to carry them around. But maybe Len's account, as well as his description of Bill Hooks as what he calls trench choppers, suggests that they were not only used by engineers or machine gunners, but maybe they had a, a wider day-to-day -day use in the trenches for chopping kindling and other day-to-day -day tasks, um, as well as trench raids. You know, these things were obviously just floating around. They weren't all sitting on supply wagons waiting for, you know, a machine gunner to sort of come up and use them. They were obviously being used by by other sorts of soldier as well. If you know anything more about this, do do let me know in the in the comments. You know, I'm making this video because I'm, I'm, I've picked this up and I guess I'm very interested in the history of it and I'd love to learn as much as I can. Um, at the end of the war, these things made their way back into the civilian world as soldiers returned from the front. Maybe a lot of them had rural upbringings. They were familiar with these uh, and they decided they were worth taking back with them for use as tools. Now, the one thing I'm not going to do with this, I'm not going to test it out for you with any chopping. For me, this is more of a museum piece. It's more than 100 years old. Um, it would be perfectly usable. Um, many billocks, even older, are still being used. And that other example I showed you earlier is you know, certainly about the same age as this, uh, maybe a little bit older. Um, but because of the kind of unique history of this, um, I'm going to leave it as it is. I think it's earned its retirement um, and it will never it will never do any any kind of chopping on my on my watch. Um, what is interesting about this cutting edge is quickly. So it's not very sharp, but you can see here um, this bit has been sharpened with a file. It's been sharpened very roughly. Uh, and this bit has just been ignored. <laughs> so whoever it is has used it. I don't know whether that's original World War One or whether it's more, much more likely that it's been sharpened over its life because that's quite shiny. Um, and I imagine that um, if it had just been sharpened back in 100 years ago and then left, it would be rusty as hell. So I suggest, you know, it's probably been used. Um, yeah, but it's, it's certainly not very sharp now. Uh, but I think it's done all of the chopping which it needs to do in its life. Uh, and now I'm just going to kind of look after it and uh, kind of have it as a, as a bit of a... Um, bit of a memorabilia I suppose um, so thank you very much and if you've got any information on these as I say they're interesting old tools and how they were used in the kind of wartime era please do let me know thank you